Hello, family. How are we doing? Doing good? Thank you. Royston. Shout out to Royston this morning. <clears throat> good. Uh, in the Bible, we see that blessings are powerful. So let, let's start here. Let me bless you as we get ready to dive in today. I bless you now in the name of Jesus that you would know Jesus more wonderfully this morning. May God bless you and protect you. May he smile upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus, may it be. All right. Everyone, we are in a study going through the book of Colossians together, a book that's all about the amazingness of Jesus and how to rightly respond to the amazingness of Jesus as we live our lives. Here's a map, new screenshot, Google Earth. So Colossi's right in the middle there. I put a little X where Ephesus is because everybody knows where that is now. Anyways, put it there just for funsies. Uh, Paul is writing to Christians in the city of Colossae, real Christians from Rome where he's in prison. He is in prison with a guy named Epaphras who's told him about the church here in Colossae. Paul's never been to Colossae. He hopes to go there at some point, but uh, he is writing a letter to these, these Christians. And these Christians, they are real Christians. And they're fine. You know, they're, they're fine. They're they're. They're fine. They're real Christians. But in this letter, Paul is calling these Christians higher. And maybe you're experiencing that as we're going through this study today, this, this call from wherever you're at to, to raise the bar, to raise the level, to lean in more, and just to, to run after Jesus more and higher. Now, um, if you're new here or visiting or just by way of recap, there's a couple things that you probably need to have in mind today as we push forward, because today is following up right after last week. And so the main things that you want to have in your mind as we dive into our passage today is, well, let, let's put a picture up on the screen. <clears throat> okay, this is not AI. BI, right? So you've got, uh, you've got the, this picture here. What is going on in this picture? Every Christian has a choice today, right? Am I going to look at Jesus and am I going to follow Jesus, or am I going to live a normal life today? Am I going to live a normal life? Obviously, Paul wants us to be all about Jesus, to be looking at Jesus, to be amazed by Jesus, to live thankful, thankful for what Jesus has done as we seek to live a godly, holy, humble life in Christ Jesus. Paul wants us to live that way. And so in chapter 1, Paul lays out this incredible vision of Jesus. And speaking about Jesus, he says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And then it says, through Jesus, God created everything. And, and what Paul's trying to do is to pick our, our thoughts about Jesus higher, higher than what we've called Gospels Jesus, which is Philippians 2, the emptied version of Jesus. Now Jesus is refilled. He is refilled with his glory and honor and power, the kind that he had before the creation of the world. Think Revelation Jesus, eyes blazing with fire Jesus, returning in invincible power and splendor Jesus. We're, we're talking about the amazingness of Jesus, the returning one. As I said last week, if you want to follow Jesus, you look at Jesus. You look at Jesus where we saw in Colossians 3 last week where uh, we're called to set our sights, it said, on the realities of heaven where Christ is seated in the place of honor at God's right hand. And then down in verse 10, we saw how we are called to learn to know your creator and become like him, like him. So we need to keep holding on to this thought, these thoughts today, because we're continuing in this same section where Paul is trying to teach us the right way to follow Jesus, which is to look at Jesus, which is to learn to know Jesus, and to seek to become like him, seem to become like him. Now, the other way that Christians live, according to this, is normal. And normal would be defined as either legalism, trying to, trying to follow the rules but not the Jesus, or by ignoring uh, the salvation that we have in Jesus and kind of living however we want to live. 
uh, versus rightly responding to Jesus at the top. So I, we, I don't know if you've noticed, um, those of you who are reading through uh, with us, doing Bible read-through, many of you, um, 2 Corinthians had a lot of these same thoughts in them. I, when I was reading 2 Corinthians, I, I was struck by chapter 6, verse 1, where Paul's writing and he says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. And then ignore it. Like, don't, don't you know, receive God's forgiveness and grace in your life and then live as if it, as if it hasn't happened, that you haven't met with God and been, been saved by Him. Or, or another passage, very con- much connected to what we talked about last week. He, Paul's writing in, in chapter 12 of that book saying, many of you have not given up your old sins to Christians, right? You have not repented of your impurity, your sexual immorality, your eagerness for lustful pleasure. I mean, Paul talks about this stuff quite a bit to, to real Christians, to people who, who have been forgiven and, and been saved. And he's just trying, in many of his letters, trying to convince Christians to not just be real Christians, but not live like it. Like, respond, change, change for right reasons, uh, but, but you know, don't let sin just go unchallenged in your life. We talked about that last week, sexual immorality and purities and greeds and angers and r- dirty language and lying. And if, if you're a Christian, live like it. That's what Paul keeps calling his people to. So again, that was a big reminder of last week. We're picking up right where we left off, and we're going to finish this, this section today. But I'm going to start reading in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3, and it begins with these words. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, okay, we're, we'll just sit here for a while, or just sit here for a while. Since God chose, this is a motives. Paul is obsessed with motives, not just life change. That's why he doesn't want the legalism change. He wants right change. And so for here, he, he, Paul's about to talk about how to change, but before he goes any further, why? First, why are you making these positive changes in your life? One of the reasons is because Jesus is amazing. Another reason is make these changes because God chose you, and that's, that's amazing. And he chose you for a reason, not just to save you. He chose you to be a holy person, to be holy, to, 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 to be the holy people that, that he loves. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I know in, in our church we've got lots of different backgrounds, and some of you talk a lot about God's choosing, and some of you in your background, and, and maybe you talk, oh, God's choosing yay, or God's choosing no, uh, whatever your background is, um, but basically, we're going to keep it very simple today when it comes to God's choosing. God chooses. <laughs> fact. That's just a fact. God chooses. It says it right there. God chose Abraham, God chose David, God chose Moses. Jesus says, I chose you, the disciples. You didn't choose me. Like, like God chooses. That, that's just part of, and then that's not strange, it's good. Anytime we, we grapple with a concept of God that, that puts question marks in our head, we got to remember that God, God is good and he's only good. In fact, he's the only good. He's only, the only fully good. And so this is, this is good. And then we ask ourselves, why is this good? Why is it good that God chooses? John 6, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Okay? According to Jesus, without God's drawing, no one, people aren't going to come to them on their own. Romans 3, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. The, the natural starting point for humanity is not seeking God, not seeking God. Ephesians 1, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Again, talking about God's choice before the creation of the world. Okay. Everyone is free to choose God. Everyone. Everyone is free to choose God. Everyone is free to believe in Jesus and be saved. It's totally fair. Everybody can choose God. But sadly, 
God knows that nobody's going to choose him without his help, without the spirit at work, that nobody is going to seek him, that nobody's going to seek to know him. And so God, know, God knows this. He knew it from the beginning. And so from the, before the foundation of the world, God chose to make sure he communicated and he, used, he sent, it was going to send his spirit so that people would respond, would respond. Because if he didn't do that, everybody would, would say no. So the fact of God's choosing is a good thing. Again, we're not going to go, go long on this. Um, if you want to, to email me, my email is laura at rehope.co.uk. And, and, and um, we can dialogue. But this is what we call, uh, this is what we're called to. We're called to be holy. We're called to be holy and we're motivated to be holy because it's so special and it had nothing to do with us that we've been chosen to be a part of God's people. It's so special. Okay, last week we looked at a list of what we're supposed to stop doing, but now Paul wants to tell us the good things to add to our lives. And so he, he says this as we keep reading in verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must... Notice the word, must. You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and patience. Does this remind you of anything else? The, the fruit of the Spirit, right? I'm sure somebody around you can sing the fruit of the Spirit song. I can't. I, I don't do that. But uh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kind of, it, it's the same, the same uh, things. And, you know, you might look at this, these words, kindness or, or tender-hearted mercy or gentleness and think, or patience and think, yeah, yeah, that's, that's not really me. You know, uh, patience, you know, maybe that, that's not really me. And, and to that I'd say, okay, okay, maybe not yet, but this is for you. This is a growth area for you. This, this is for all of us, no matter our personalities, no matter our starting points. Uh, you can ask my, my mother. <laughs> she would say to you very clearly, and she tells everybody, patience was not my starting point. Now, she says patience is not my thing, but I'm saying yeah, patience is not my, my starting point. But that doesn't give me an excuse. Doesn't give me an excuse. Over the years, I have had to learn how to put on patience. I've had to grow in people patience. Thank you. Not. <laughs> no, I've had to grow in people patience over the years. And, and to become more kind and more compassionate than Brian in the er early years. I've, I've, I've had to learn these things. And I have learned these things, Mom. <laughs> I have. But which of these things, you know, when you're looking at this, might be an important growth area for you. Maybe you've kind of said, oh, I'm not this way. Well, we're called to this. Um, Tender-hearted mercy. Kindness. Humility. Gentleness. I'm just a bold person. Nah, you're a punk. Uh, gentleness. Patience, patience. Because you have the Holy Spirit, you can 100% grow from where you are in these. In fact, we're called to grow in these areas. So remember last week in verse 10, it said, we're called to learn to know your creator and become like him. That's one of our callings, to become like our creator. These are the attributes of your creator. These are the attributes of Jesus. These are attributes of the Spirit, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is part of looking at Jesus and becoming like Him. All right, so we have this, and then it goes on to say in verse 13, continuing, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so... You must forgive others. Are you, are you making allowances for other people's faults? Uh, shortcomings, imperfections, irritations, annoyances. Because breaking news, friends, everyone has faults. 
Like everyone has faults, everyone. Are you making allowance for that? You're making allowances for that, especially in those closest to you. Are you making allowance for your parents' faults? Or for your kids? Or for your spouse? Or for your friends? Or co-workers? Are you making allowances for, for the people's faults? And how are you doing at forgiving anyone who offends you? I mean, this generation is so easily offended, so hyper-offended. I mean, you're like, nah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, hyper-offended. But you are called to be hyper-forgiving, not hyper-offended, not easily offended, to, to, be, to be a forgiver instead of someone who's annoyed and who's upset at the, the shortcomings of people around your life. I'm gonna, I'll draw it out like this. So Jesus has the attributes. Jesus has the attributes uh, yeah, forgiving, kindness, patience, th- those attributes. And we're receiving them ourselves from Jesus. Jesus is, being forgi- is forgiving you. He's being kind to you. He's being patient with you. Uh, and a lot of things. So that's the blue arrow there showing how we receive these from Jesus. But then what God wants for us is, again, from verse 10, to become like our creator and to give to others what we are constantly be, being given by Jesus, the purple arrow there, where Jesus has forgiven us, and so we forgive others. Jesus has been more kind to us than we deserve, and so then we're going to be more kind to others than they deserve. We give what we... we God, Jesus has been more patient with us than we would even understand, and so we're going to be more patient with others than, again, they deserve or they even understand that we're being with them. God's appointed his chosen people to show this generation what, what God is like by, by giving to everyone the things that God's given to us. And that's how we represent Jesus to others, by becoming like him and giving to others what we've been given. Now, I, I know that there's people that are listening who have been so hurt by people. And, and the topic of forgiving here comes up, and they're so hurt, they're so affected, they're, they're, they're so, sh- and you're, you're still carrying it, and you've been carrying it, and the pain is deep, and, and the wounds are significant, and you're like, I, you know that you haven't truly forgiven them, it, it's, it's, so, it's so hurtful still. Friends, for your own good, for the sake of your own heart, for the sake of your own well-being, let it go and forgive them. Forgive them and let it go, no matter how hard it seems or how wrong it seems or how, how impossible it seems. Forgive. Don't carry it any longer. Let it go. Why? Well, it will be good for you, but more importantly, because Jesus Christ has forgiven you of everything even more than, 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 than you know. And he wants you to be like him, representing him well, doing, what he, doing to others what he has done for you, forgiving everyone of everything. And this is important. This is important, friends. It's time, and I know it's, I know it's hard, but if you're going to be praying through this and working through this process, there's three things that I would be including in my prayers if I were you. I would be thankful. God, I'm so thankful for you forgiving me. I'm so thankful. Secondly, I would, I would now I choose to forgive. And then thirdly, Holy Spirit, come and heal my wounded heart. So my prayer might be like, uh, God, I'm so thankful for your forgiveness and mercy. I I know that I mess up. I'm very aware of that. In fact, I know that I mess up more than I'm even aware. Thank you for your forgiveness for me. I now choose to forgive this person of this thing and every single thing that they've done. But this person of this thing. But Jesus, you know it hurts. And I forgive them, but I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and heal my wounded heart. Bring healing to these deep wounds. In Jesus' name. Challenging. 
But Jesus challenges us to the best things. And this is, this is so good. Paul keeps writing. And he says in verse 14, above all, above all, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Three words here, right? Love, peace, thankfulness. It says, above all, clothe yourselves with love. Remember 1 Corinthians 13 from your Bible read through a few weeks ago? Uh, basically, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you can be the most awesome person in all of the universe, but without love, worthless. You can be the, the most spiritually incredible person, but without love, you are completely missing it all. Like, like love, it's the most important thing. And, and so in 1 Corinthians, also we hear the same words. Love is patient, it says. Love is kind, you know, these same words. This is what, what love is like. Without patience and kindness, whatever spiritual maturity you have, I mean, you're missing it. It's worthless without that. So how are you doing? How are you doing at loving people in your life with, with holy love? A love that is patient, a love that is kind, a love that is not easily offended, a love that makes allowances for each other's faults, a love that is quick to forgive. Sometimes people come up to me and they're like, Brian, how can I be more patient? And I, the answer is love the person better. Ooh. How can I be more kind? Love the person better. Love the person better. A lack of kindness is a lack of love. A lack of patience is a shortcoming in the area of love. You want to grow in those things, you, you grow in love and patience together. They're, they're together. So Paul says, above all, close yourself with love, and then it talks about peace. And in, basically he's saying, have peace create peace. Have peace, create peace in your environment. Be a, be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. M make peace. As, as you, I mean, I had such a powerful experience with this years ago uh, in 2020 where I just felt like God did a transforming peace work in my heart. And, and that was helped me to, to help people. Um, here's a drawing here. Uh, when you when it comes to peace, we receive peace from Jesus, and then it flows out of us into, a spe into our spheres around us. And I, I draw this out there as basic as it is because I see so many people skipping the Jesus bit trying to get to the peace bit. And, and so they're like, okay, how, how am I going to get peace in my life? Well, I'm going to deal with my life pace. I'm going to get better sleep. I'm going I'm to do all these things that I'm told to do, and yes, please, please get better sleep or whatever the case may be. Deal with your life pace, great, but you can't skip the spiritual stuff and get to the spiritual realities of Jesus' peace. So, so do the life pace stuff, but don't skip the Jesus every morning. Jesus, here I am. I surrender my stresses. I trust you. You can't have peace without surrender and trust. Jesus, I'm going to trust you with this crisis. I'm going to trust you with my stress today. I'm going to lay them down. I'm going to say, help me in this, and I'm going to trust you in this. Fill me with your peace that guards my heart and mind and anxieties and worries and stresses and fears. That guards, me, guards my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we're receiving peace from Jesus. And then finally it says here, and always be thankful. It's going to talk about thankfulness three times in a row. So I'm just going to, I'm going to keep reading. So it says, and always be thankful, verse 16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your minds. No. That's not what it says. 
It says, fill your, your lives. The message about Jesus isn't just so you know more about Jesus or you have more better thinking in your thoughts. It's about your lives and how you live. Better living, not just better thinking. Let the message of Jesus fill your lives so that it, it overflows, so that you live differently. And then it goes on to say, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom God, God gives. Help people to know their creator more so they can be like him. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. There's that thankfulness again, part two, or the second time it comes up. And then it says, whatever, well, where am I at? And whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is big. And with this, Paul is bringing it all back together. This whole section so far of chapter 3, he's bringing it all back together. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of Jesus. We've been talking about this. I've said the words representative of Jesus or representing Jesus throughout this message already. But the clarity on how to put this section together is we look at Jesus. And then we seek to become like Jesus, stopping the evil things that are not like Jesus, and putting on the righteous things like kindness and patience, which are like Jesus. We're doing all this so that we are changing to become more like Jesus, uh, more like our Creator, because we're called to represent Him. And we represent Him by changing to be more like Him. That's how we represent Him. When you see, when people see you, they're supposed to get better understanding of what Jesus is like. Wow, I can't believe you were able to forgive that person. Oh, that's what Jesus is like. Or, man, you're so kind and patient. Oh, that's what Jesus is like. Or, you know, we spend a lot of time together and, and you, 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 there's a purity about you. There's not that uh, sexual sin or dirty talk stuff coming out of your mouth or your, your choice of words is, is just, it's just different than most people. Oh, that's what Jesus is like. He doesn't talk that way. He doesn't use those words. Wow. I mean, maybe you've, you've heard of people and they're like, oh, they, they've looked at Christians and they're like, ah, hypocrites and, and uh, not interested in, in Jesus because of how Christians are. That's because that's, that would be an example of us misrepresenting Jesus. It's a bit of a fail there, I would say. But here we are today. And one of the greatest callings on your life is to set your sights on the realities of heaven and, and Jesus, to learn to know your creator, to become like him, to live your life as a representative of Jesus, and to be a living example of what Jesus is like to our generation. That's a sacred calling. And God chose you to be the holy people he loves, representing Jesus in this generation. And then the final words there, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Three mentions of thankfulness. Three mentions, because remember, our calling isn't just to know this way of living or to, to do this way of living. It's driven by responding. Thankfulness is a response word. Jesus, I am so thankful, and so I'm going to run this path. I'm, I'm going to be amazed, and I'm going to be thankful for what you've done for me. And what you've done for me even recently. Here's the challenges for today. Challenge number one. What is your main Jesus attribute to prioritize growing in starting today? Last week we talked about the main thing to go to war and get rid of. This week is what is the main Jesus attribute to pursue and to put on in these phrases? Tenderhearted mercy was one that was listed kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiving everyone, love, peace, thankfulness to God. What's the Jesus attribute? What is the Jesus attribute that, that God's calling you to lean in and address and to, to grow in? And then secondly, who do you need to forgive? And forgive them. Let, let's, 
let's take a moment of, of you and Jesus time. Let's just pause, and, and why don't you just close your eyes. And, and when it comes to, to God, start with some thankfulness in the quietness here. God, I am so thankful. And just some thankful prayers to God for a moment about his forgiveness or things that he's done in your life or calling you to believe in Jesus. Thankful prayers. And then forgiving prayers. And maybe you tie that in with thankfulness. God, I'm so thankful for your forgiveness of me. I choose to forgive. And come and heal my wounded heart. Then surrendered prayers, receiving prayers. What, what are the stress pieces? What are the, what are this, what are the anxiety, the stress pieces in your life? Just bring that situation to Jesus. Say, Jesus, here is my, here's the situation in my life that are robbing my peace. I trust you with this. Help me with this. Guide me with this. Intervene in this. And give me your peace about this. And then finally, it's time to re recommit to your calling to be a representative of Jesus in your homes, in your friendship networks, at, at work, in your, all of your life, whatever spheres are in your life. It's like, Jesus, once again this week, I can recommit to representing you well, rightly, in all my spheres. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to help every person who was praying out, calling out to you in prayer in, during this time. That you would help every person. Why should you help them? Because you want us to change and be more like your son Jesus and to grow in these very things. You want us to be people who are forgiven. You want us to be people who are growing in these areas. And so help us. Help us. Take our stresses, fill us with peace, guide us forward, lead us clearly in the name of Jesus. May it be. Amen.